not sure why, but the giant scorpions I've seen on the island are far more disturbing than most of the dinosaurs. Rather than simply kill its prey, Pomonoscorpius gigantus injects its victims with a tranquilizing poison, then eats its unconscious prey alive. This subspecies has a large pair of pincers that seem connected to the same toxin sacs as the tail. I've never seen another scorpion that has this adaptation, but I've never seen another scorpion that's larger than I am either. Trying to tame a monster like Pulmonoscorpius gigantus sounds like a crazy idea, but I suppose the ability to knock out a foe could come in handy. It could certainly make incapacitating some of the island's other creatures much easier. Megaloceros lattice coronum is a very skittish herbivore, found mostly in the forests and mountains of the island. Because of its large size, its fraught demeanor would be strange in any other place. But Megaloceros knows how fierce the predators of the island are, and that it is safer to flee from them than to risk its life in a fight. The antlers of Megaloceros are very large and make for an excellent source of keratin. This, of course, makes it a valuable resource. Unfortunately, hunting Megaloceros is not easy because of their quick speed and ability to bound over most obstacles. Megaloceros is a jack-of-all-trades creature, and many who ride it value its versatility. It is decently powerful, and its resilience, speed, and ability to jump often come in handy. Finally, the male Megaloceros's charging horn attack tends to cause targets to bleed, decreasing their health, stamina, and speed until healed. Ranging from 8 to 12 feet tall, Forest Racidae Rapidae Salta is a highly aggressive avian that is just barely capable of very brief flight. Instead, it uses its wings primarily for balance during its high-speed sprints. Forest Racidae flight is actually closer to an impressive, sustained leap or glide that is assisted and lengthened by flapping its wings. Forest Racidae shows interesting traits related to theropods, such as Uteraptor, Carnotaurus, and Tyrannosaurus. It has many similar traits, such as general shape and predator patterns, but its attacks tend towards lightning-fast dashes and beak slashes. Forest Racidae is an effective combat mount, particularly for harassing and scouting. Riders of Forest Racidae gain most of the benefits of a fast, mobile ground-based theropod, while also gaining some of the freedom of movement from a flyer, assuming the rider can coax Forest Racidae into staying in the air over a long leap. The much larger ancestor of water birds like the stork or pelican, Pelagornis myosanus, shares many traits with its modern-day brethren. However, it seems to spend far more time hunting for fish over the open deep sea. In fact, I have rarely spotted a wild Pelagornis anywhere near the coasts of the main island, as it prefers to rest its wings by paddling on the ocean's surface, rather than waddling along the island's beaches. Perhaps this behavior is a result of its survival instincts. The early Miocene was a post-dinosaur epoch, after all, and Pelagornis would not be accustomed to such predators. Considering how quickly it flees from humans, one can hardly blame its caution. Because of its ability to fly, walk, and surface swim, a tent Pelagornis is one of the island's most versatile mounts, but this comes at a cost. The same webbed feet that allow Pelagornis to serenely maneuver along the ocean surface prevent it from carrying prey off the ground, which may limit its appeal to some survivors. Castoroides velicon chisa is a large mammalian herbivore that tends to live near water. Unlike other large beaver species, this one retains the chisel-shaped teeth of modern beavers. As is typical for beavers, they build dams as habitats, but the larger creatures on the island have a tendency to trample them. As a result, finding unsullied resource-rich dams in the wild is quite rare. Castoroides itself doesn't seem to realize how dangerous the island is. I don't know if it's simply too dumb to notice the dangers, or if it just doesn't care. But Castoroides happily goes about its day playing in the water and gnawing on wood. The value of a tamed Castoroides is obvious from its physiology. The creature naturally gathers wood extremely efficiently, far more than most species on the island. It's not the strongest creature, so it can only carry limited amounts, but it is a natural lumberjack. Its saddle doubles as a mobile crafting station, which allows for producing complex items on the go. Smilodon brutalis is a solitary hunter, generally found in cold, lightly wooded areas. The island's mountains are the perfect habitat, 
as the mammal's fur keeps it safe from the bitter temperature. While its huge fangs are excellent for delivering death blows, the creature's claws can be just as deadly. Despite normally being a solitary creature, Smilodon brutalis are not opposed to hunting in small packs. In fact, they have to do this to take down larger prey, such as mammoths. Enough saber-tooths can take down a Carnotaurus, perhaps even a Tyrannosaurus. Either way, Smilodon brutalis should not be underestimated. While not as fast as raptors, there's no denying the saber-tooth's increased resilience and power. In addition, well-trained saber-tooth can be taught to use their claws to flay corpses. This may sound morbid, but it is among the best ways to quickly gather large quantities of hide from the giant beasts of the island. Equus magnus appears to be an ancestor of the modern horse. Based on its stripes, it may be the African variant of Equus giganteus, which appeared in North America during the Ice Age, but that is pure conjecture. Its behavior in the wild is similar to that of other wild members of the Equus genus. It sustains itself by grazing, while keeping safe from predators by living in herds and outrunning its attackers via superior speed and stamina. Horse and man have long been partners in survival, and this remains true on the island. In Equus, survivors will find a trusty steed or pack animal that can carry them swiftly across the land. Taming an Equus has proven interesting, requiring carefully approaching the creature in the wild, mounting it, and then carefully soothing over time by feeding it vegetables. In fact, Equus's reliability has led some survivors to construct special saddles for them. I even encountered a man who added extra saddle pouches that doubled as mobile crafting stations for chemical supplies, foodstuffs, and other items. Although not as robust as what you might find within a village, this utility helped him live a nomadic, solitary lifestyle. Some survivors employ Equus to herd and wrangle other creatures with a specialized lasso. This tool is sometimes effective for self-defense as well, as Equus is limited in battle on its own, at least compared to aggressive prehistoric carnivores. Pelovia maxima perfectly embodies the element of surprise. Though nanoctidopids such as Pelovia were once thought to be herbivores, I discovered that this creature is, in fact, a patient hunter of the most intelligent sort. After burying beneath the jungle floor, Pelovia enters a state of hibernation and can go extended periods without any food. When some unfortunate creature eventually wanders by, Pelovia bursts forth from the ground, tearing into its prey with its large canines before the victim can react. Though Pelovia is ill-suited to the life of a mount, its usefulness in staging an ambush or as a village guardian cannot be understated. With a tamed pack of Pelovia, one could assemble a literal organic minefield of deadly claws and teeth. However, any ambushes using Pelovia must be planned well in advance, as it will refuse to hibernate if it senses any threat nearby. The best adjective to describe Canis maxdirus is scary. This pack animal is a cunning and brutal predator, capable of taking down prey of nearly any size. In addition to being a vicious hunter, it is the size of a small horse, meaning even the largest predators aren't necessarily safe from the packs. Unlike most creatures on the island, Canis is a dedicated pack hunter and rarely hunts alone. When in a pack, Canis are naturally spurred to fight for their lives with increased effectiveness, while the most experienced Canis will be designated Alpha and gain an even stronger enhancement. The species has an incredible affinity for teamwork. Obviously, Canis is a thrilling battle mount. It is fairly fast, very strong, and agile. It can leap almost as well as the island's battle cats. Riding a supercharged Alpha Canis into battle at the head of a bloodthirsty pack is a thrill for which most warriors would gladly proclaim, today is a good day to die. If utilized correctly, Canis can be a useful aid to your discovery efforts. It has developed a keen sense of smell that enables it to detect things that most creatures can't. I've even seen them used to find creatures that are hidden beneath the surface. Didicurus costa saxum is one of the island's non-aggressive herbivores, generally found in the mountains and grasslands. Large and well-armored, it has a supply of fat under its plates to keep it warm and fed in the cold. Didicurus has adapted well to the dangers of the island, perhaps even better than the Ankylosaurus. Didicurus has two very different reactions to predators. Against smaller foes, it generally uses its spike tail to inflict as much damage as possible. 
Against larger predators, however, it pulls its tail underneath itself to form a solid armored ball that is nearly impossible for creatures to pierce, from which it can actually roll away to relative safety. Didicurus is a highly prized work animal on the island. Its spiked tail is ideal for quickly shattering the large rocks, so Didicurus is a very efficient quarry worker. In addition, its affinity for rocks has allowed it to carry stone at a reduced weight. In case their quarry gets raided, Didicurus riders have a very difficult to kill mount. Cnidaria omnimorph is another example of a creature which should not exist. It has traits that seem derived from many types of jellyfish. It possesses the size and shape of large egg yolk jellies, the powerful sting of certain box jellies, and the bioluminescence of deep sea jellies. This all combines to make a dangerous creature that lights up the deepest reaches of the ocean. Cnidaria is not generally aggressive because it lacks normal perceptive senses. It generally just floats along on the current until something gets close enough to sense, at which point it attacks. While its attacks are not directly powerful, its sting injects an incredibly strong and fast-acting sedative. As Cnidaria is barely more intelligent than a plant, there's no effective method to tame one. Most tribes kill Cnidaria on sight, then collect its reserve of powerful sedative to use in technically advanced long-distance tranquilizers. Dimetrodon calorecta is a much calmer predator than most on the island. Because it lives off smaller prey than humans, it generally ignores anything much larger than a coelacanth. Dimetrodon is one of the few carnivores on the island that could be classified as reasonably friendly in the wild. The sail on Dimetrodon's back is an especially fascinating thing. It can be angled to provide shade from the sun and allows Dimetrodon to disperse heat more quickly. The inner workings of the sail can also restrict blood flow in the creature to hold in excessive heat. Together, these two traits allow Dimetrodon to comfortably survive in any climate, though they are most commonly found in the swamplands which are rich in prey. If Dimetrodon was a bit larger or didn't have that massive sail, it would make a decent mount. However, its main use to survivors is to utilize the sail's insulating capabilities. Just being near Dimetrodon gives excellent protection from both heat and cold, which has saved my life through more than one ice blizzard in the frozen Northlands. Utah Raptor Prime is an incredibly aggressive subspecies of Utah Raptor found on the island. It tends to travel in small hunting packs, attacking smaller prey with its sharp teeth and enlarged foreclaws. When hunting in packs, the pack leader can vocalize a signal that acts as a battle cry. Be prepared to run or fight if you hear the call of the Utah Raptor. The pack will repeat the calls and attack with much greater intensity. One of the faster creatures on the island, Utah Raptor often uses their pack numbers to their advantage by swarming around their prey before it can react. The large curved talon on the second toe of this subspecies seems particularly suited for dealing significant damage. Utah Raptor Prime usually kill its prey with numerous slashing and biting attacks in rapid sequence. What the Utah Raptor lacks in size, it makes up for in ingenuity. Rather than chase down smaller creatures, Utah Raptor will pounce and pin its prey to the ground. Despite its normally aggressive nature, Utah Raptors have become one of the primary combat mounts for roaming bands of raiders, as well as scouts for larger collectives. Those who ride Utah Raptor claim they are difficult to tame, but then fiercely loyal. As a carnivore, once tamed, they require a steady stream of meat to sustain. Deodon comidentis is the largest known species of entelodont, an omnivorous family of ancient mammals that are sometimes referred to as hell pigs. Even though Deodon has as many similarities to modern Hippopotamidae as it does to Suina, I found that to be a suitable nickname. Deodon is as mean as it looks, and any survivor who wanders too close will find that out the hard way. As an omnivore with a voracious appetite, Deodon scavenges, forages, and hunts to survive. It has little qualms when it comes to its diet, and that has helped it thrive on the island's harsh tundra. Its temper hasn't hurt either, as many would-be predators would rather seek out less vicious prey. Many tribes have made excellent use of Deodon packs within their war parties, not only because of its fierce nature, but due to its extraordinary ability to rapidly heal itself. I've theorized that this healing factor is why it seems to have such a high metabolism, though what is particularly extraordinary is its capability to share this benefit with nearby creatures. 
I have even heard some survivors mention that the Deodon also has a unique ability to root out rare mushrooms as well. Pteranodon wyvernus is a large pterosaur, capable of flying more quickly than any creature I have witnessed on this island thus far. It seems to have relatively poor stamina in comparison to its quick speed, however, making frequent pit stops on the beaches before taking off again. While other humans I've seen on the island still insist on calling it a pterodactyl, this is inaccurate. Pteranodon wyvernus's poor fighting and defensive skills mean they are likely to scavenge any number of dead animals rather than engage in dangerous combat with other creatures. They also flee at the slightest sign of trouble. Because of this, they are one of the most common creatures to be found darting across the island skies. Pteranodons seem to be among most popular flying companions from what I have witnessed, possibly because they are relatively easy to tame with a slingshot or bow. Mounting a Pteranodon must be among the fastest and safest ways to get around the island, but it doesn't provide any measure of secrecy in comparison to travel on land through the dense foliage. Whether its size is caused by adaptation to the island's other inhabitants, or by crossbreeding with another larger species, Melanocetus anglopescum is the largest form of anglerfish I've ever heard of. Typically found among the deepest, darkest expanses of the ocean, this creature preys on smaller fish while being an excellent source of food for larger predators. Melanocetus has an array of bioluminescent light pods at the end of stalks on its head. Like typical anglerfish, it primarily uses these to attract smaller creatures and trick them into coming close enough for Melanocetus to consume the prey. This often makes wild Melanocetus itself relatively easy to spot among the briny depths. Exploring the depths of the ocean can be difficult. The cold, the lack of air, and the shocking absence of light combine to make travel very dangerous. A tamed anglerfish can use the natural light at the end of its stalks to illuminate the depths, making exploration not only safer, but more lucrative, as I've heard some survivors use this creature to harvest the silica pearls found throughout the ocean's depths. Gigantopithecus vibrerator is a strange creature. It is usually quite passive, but it has a very short temper when it comes to its own personal space. Once another creature gets close, this gentle giant quickly becomes a rampaging beast. Best to give them a wide berth. I have occasionally seen Gigantopithecus jumping to grab vines that it can traverse and swing on, but otherwise, it seems most happy to lay about picking berries from plants lazily. In addition to being at home picking berries, a tame Gigantopithecus can be taught to harvest the fibers found on many island plants as well. It appears to be entirely content to picket plants all day, eat the berries, and carry fiber resources for its tribe. Playful once tamed, it seems to enjoy throwing the creatures or riders it's carrying into the air. It probably feels that this activity is a game, but clever brigands can use this game to vault over walls and small cliffs. Sincerely, Helena Walker